This is a really commonly requested video on my channel, and so today I want to finally talk about my 10 favorite philosophy books. I studied philosophy for a very long time. I earned my PhD in 2019, and that meant that I spent about 10 years in college and then in graduate school studying philosophy and reading philosophy books. And even though I've left academia, I still read philosophy, and now I talk about philosophy sometimes on this channel with all of you. So I think it could be fun to go through and talk about those philosophy books that really have stood out to me as I've read all of these books. So the first book I think is going to sound rather surprising, and that's Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. This is surprising for a couple of reasons. For one, you might know that I was trained in what would typically be called analytic departments. And these are philosophy departments that mostly talk about logic, language, seeing philosophy as kind of continuous with the sciences. And these are contrasted often with continental departments that tend to put a bigger stress on thinkers like Hegel. Another reason this is surprising is because one of the worst experiences of my life in graduate school was with this book. My very first semester of graduate school, I took a class on Hegel, and the task that we were given was to become as familiar with Hegel as possible in a semester, and so we were told to just read as much Hegel as we possibly could. And I don't think that I really understood it at all. I've lately undertaken a mission to try and really kind of fill in philosophical gaps, and Hegel is at the top of my list. And because of Hegel, I need to read Kant and other things. And so it feels weird to put this in a top 10, right? Except that there is something so invigorating about reading Hegel. Even though Hegel is not a thinker that I fully grasp, Hegel is a thinker that, man, I, I hold the phenomenology of spirit sometimes and just think this book might contain the secrets of the universe. And I'm like wrestling with this text over and over again. Another reason I've really come to appreciate Hegel and really felt moved to put him on the list, even at number 10, is that Hegel is a crucial and foundational figure for so much later philosophy. I would say that if you're talking about German philosophy in particular, the only person who could really compete is Kant. And, and what happens is that I end up encountering people talking about Hegel while talking about other topics that I find really interesting. And so I'm just drawn to this book over and over again. And maybe it sounds a little bit weird to talk about me being so attracted to this book, and thus I'm going to put it at my top 10, but I, as I did it, it just felt right. I felt like I really had to include Hegel. So the next two, number nine and number eight, I actually wanna talk about in tandem. Uh, even though they are very different kinds of books, they center on some similar topics, and I think it's easier if we just talk about both of them. And so that's number nine, which is Ludwig Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations, and then The Foundations of Arithmetic by Gottlob Frege. My real love in philosophy, especially when I was in graduate school, was with philosophy of language. The questions of how language operates, how we manage to communicate with each other at all, just fascinated me early on in my career. With Wittgenstein, I had an amazing seminar experience when I was an undergraduate still. There were just three students in the class, but somehow it was still able to be taught, where we just read the philosophical investigations from cover to cover, we read it slowly. We would sometimes talk about a single paragraph. If you know anything about the investigations, you'll know that it's divided into two major parts, and those parts are just divided into paragraphs, and it's kind of unstructured. Sometimes the paragraphs will form sequences where clearly Wittgenstein is exploring one idea um, progressively, but many of the times it can feel a little bit haphazard to read. It's not maybe the ideal when we talk about clarity in philosophical expression, but it is a really amazing work. Wittgenstein was actually turning against himself when he was writing philosophical investigations. He had written an earlier book called The Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Oftentimes we just call it The Tractatus. In that book, Wittgenstein develops what's called a picture theory of language. It's highly regimented and it's highly logical, even though still sometimes when you read The Tractatus, it almost feels like reading a mystical mathematics text or something. And Wittgenstein became progressively disillusioned with his picture of language. And so he wanted to pay more attention to the use of language. In the investigations, Wittgenstein is sort of famously putting forward uh, a use theory of meaning, which is a very intuitive idea, but it's actually hard to make that precise in a way that's like really compelling. And one of the ways that he presents his ideas, though, are not through clear arguments where you have a premise and another premise and then a conclusion and we just sort of build on this but rather through a series of like interesting examples we have this whole thing about private language for instance or the beetle in the box example or even just the very beginning of the philosophical investigations this book hooked me on philosophy of language really 
And that actually became the subject of my dissertation. I wrote my dissertation on theories of truth, but it was from a heavily linguistic point of view. And I ended up doing a lot of interdisciplinary work in linguistics when I was in graduate school. And I wouldn't have done that if it weren't for Wittgenstein, or for that matter, if it weren't for Frege and the foundations of arithmetic. It sounds a little bit strange to think that a book on arithmetic, so on mathematics and exploring the concept of number, would be so important to a philosopher of language. But actually, Frege ended up, while thinking about number, actually ended up usually thinking about the way that we use language to describe mathematical facts. The foundations of arithmetic ends up presenting a very different kind of way of looking at language than you find in Wittgenstein. And Frege would develop this in other papers, like on sense and reference, or one of the great philosophical essays ever written, which is called Thought. Frege is probably more friendly to the mathematical analysis of language that you would see in, for instance, a lot of formal semantics now being done in linguistics departments. And that's the kind of work that I did a little bit of, even though I was in a philosophy department. I really saw myself as being kind of interdisciplinary between philosophy and linguistics. Now, before we go on to our next book, I want to take a moment and thank today's sponsor, Brilliant. So a lot of people have asked me how I have transitioned out of getting a philosophy PhD and going into the tech world. It was easier for me than others in part because I did work in logic in graduate school, but still I had to teach myself quite a few skills in order to make it in a non-academic context. And when I was teaching myself those skills, it would have been a lot easier if I had had a tool like Brilliant. Using Brilliant in just 15 minutes a day, you can learn about math, data science, and computer science. They make it simple, easy, and fun. Well, let's say that you're interested in data analysis. Using Brilliant, you can follow a structured lesson plan that's going to introduce you to the fundamentals like probability, and get you all the way to talking about neural networks. The first 200 people who use my link get a 20% discount on a Brilliant subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Jared Henderson. And on top of all that, you get a 30 day free trial. I particularly recommend that you look at those classes about probability. Probability is a fundamental part of how we make sense of the world, and yet so many of us fall prey to really simple probabilistic fallacies. So learning a little bit of probability theory is useful for just about anybody. And if that sounds interesting to you, make sure that you use my link down below. So the next book is completely different than anything about language. And this book is The Constellations of Philosophy by Boethius, which is a fairly recent addition to my top 10. I read this several years ago, and it's really stuck with me ever since. The Constellations of Philosophy tells the story of Boethius. He's, he's a Roman politician who has sort of found himself in a kind of political trouble, and he's likely going to be executed. And he's in prison, and he's distraught, and he's visited by Lady Philosophy. And Lady Philosophy walks him through a series of arguments which are presented as a form of kind of discourse, but there's also poetry and song about what, what actually matters in life, about what is truly good, and about how even though Boethius is about to lose everything, through philosophy he can still find happiness. You see, I experienced something kind of strange when I left graduate school. Because I had left academia, primarily because the job prospects were just so bad, I kind of felt like I had to give up on philosophy. And I think part of that was like a coping mechanism. And I'll talk more about that later when I get to another book. But one of the things that helped me fall back in love with philosophy was reading more classical philosophy that was interested in those deep metaphysical questions, but somehow didn't think that those were separate from the practical questions about how you can live a good life. The Constellations of Philosophy is just a great, is a great and very accessible work of Neoplatonism. You know, a lot of the work that we would call Neoplatonism, like the work of Plotinus, is incredibly dense, very hard to read. The Constellation of Philosophy, by contrast, is actually really simple. It feels very pastoral in a way, and thus you'll be introduced to the ideas of Neoplatonism and generally classical Greek and Roman philosophy, but in a way that makes it uh, very digestible. All right, so now we're getting to the top five, and we're going to go back and talk a little bit more of that analytic philosophy, philosophy of language stuff, and talk about Truth and Objectivity by Crispin Wright. Truth and Objectivity was actually a series of lectures that Crispin Wright gave. And in this these series of lectures, he is exploring the notion of truth and is advocating for a theory that's sometimes called truth pluralism, which is the idea that there are many different properties of truth in the world. I ended up writing my dissertation on the subject of truth. And Truth and Objectivity was one of those books where a few of us in the graduate program uh, who were all interested in these issues about the metaphysics of truth, this was one of like our go-to reference texts. This was the, the text 
that all of us talked about all the time. I was not even like the biggest lover of this text compared to some of the people that I went to graduate school with, um, but it was such a foundational work that all of us had to reference it, at least in some capacity. And, and so I kind of almost used truth and objectivity as a kind of stand-in for all of those books about truth that ended up being really important to me. But if you were interested in like those other books, another one would be Truth by Paul Horwich, uh, Truth is One in Many by Michael Lynch, who was on my dissertation committee, and um, Conceptions of Truth by Wolfgang Kuna. And I was drawn to talking about theories of truth in part just because it's like this foundational problem of figuring out what truth is, what it means for a statement to be true, just felt like one of those grand, timeless philosophical puzzles that I, perhaps in my hubris, thought I could try to solve. And that's kind of one of the crazy things about doing philosophy is you're often going to be dealing with an ancient question, a question that philosophers have tried to answer for thousands of years, and then you come along and you're in your 20s and you're going to graduate school and you think, yeah, you know what, they couldn't have done it, but I bet I can solve the problem. So now that we're in our top five, I think we're going to start seeing a bit more focus on just like classic works of philosophy that most of you would probably recognize. And the fifth book on my list is The Gay Science by Friedrich Nietzsche. This was a recent read for me, like really recent, but the book skyrocketed on my list. People have kind of asked me about like my philosophical commitments. You could sort of pick them up from various videos, but I think that if I were gonna like list a few of them, like I'm a theist, um, so I do believe that God exists. I'm typically a moral realist. I'm a virtue ethicist, so I believe that um, ethics is a matter of cultivating virtue and good character. And if you took all of those things together and then thought, like, what is the antithesis of all of that? The answer would probably be Nietzsche. And so it might be a little bit surprising to see Nietzsche on this list. For, however, for one, I believe that if you're going to believe something, you should be willing to wrestle with the best versions of the arguments against it or the best representatives of an alternative way of viewing the world. And Nietzsche is one of the most compelling writers that I've ever encountered. The Gay Science is an amazing book. It's written as a series of aphorisms. Those aphorisms are collected into books. Again, it's hard to follow the strict arguments that you would find, but he's not writing in that kind of analytical, logical style. He's an evocative pro stylist, and he's trying to really actually evoke a response from you rather than compel you with the force of his deductive prowess. Is I, I'd always thought of Nietzsche as kind of dark. I always thought of Nietzsche as, a, as presenting a fairly dark alternative to how I generally see the world. And I realized that that's just a caricature of Nietzsche. It's just not true. Instead with Nietzsche, there is actually genuinely like this like love of life. Maybe you partly see this in Nietzsche's opposition to Schopenhauer's pessimism. Ideas about eternal recurrence or the Ubermensch actually have a kind of vitality to them where it's Nietzsche saying that even if you knew, for instance, that the world would recur over and over again, and you would have to endure all the same suffering over and over again, could you find a way to still be happy? And that's sort of the characteristic of the Ubermensch. So my fourth favorite philosophy book is A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume. Now, some people are going to say in the comments that there is a book that is better than A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume, and that's his later inquiry. And they have a point here. So one of the things that happened with Hume is that Hume publishes a treatise of human nature. It totally flops. Hume described it as falling stillborn from the press. As a matter of publication, it was a total failure. And Hume went about actually refining his arguments, changing his presentation, and later publishes a very similar book called An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Because of this fact, a lot of people think that you only need to read the inquiry. And for some people, that may end up being adequate. However, A Treatise of Human Nature really stands out to me. Um, one, biographically. I took a seminar on this class, and I found that even as I have gone in my own directions philosophically, some of those most formative books actually involved great teaching experiences. Uh, and uh, being in a seminar on A Treatise of Human Nature with a terrific Hume scholar named Don Baxter um, was one of those really formative experiences for me. Really teaching you how to truly interpret a text. It's where I think I learned it the best. And because of this, I ended up wrestling with fairly niche issues in Hume's treatise about the relationship between the mind and the world when that came to doing metaphysics, something that 
Hume theme, seems to be anti-metaphysical, and yet he does a lot of metaphysics on those pages as well. And I was trying to figure out, like, how can you make sense of that on Humean terms? And sort of solving a problem internal to Hume, or trying to, uh, and, and it's this beautiful example of trying to get inside the mind of a thinker. And so you really have to understand how their mind and how their system works so that you can then try to take it further. The thing that's kind of lurking over all of this discussion that I have to point out is that Hume is one of the great skeptics. So skeptics are people who deny the possibility of knowledge or at least claim that lots of things that we think we can know, we actually can't. And Hume is following in that great tradition of skepticism that you find not just in Western philosophy, but in Eastern philosophy as well. I realized that the foundations of a lot of the things that I believe were incredibly fraught in ways that I still can't quite reconcile. Believing anything is often kind of taking a bit of a leap of faith. Immanuel Kant describes Hume as awakening him from his dogmatic slumber, and that's what happens when Kant enters from the pre-critical phase to the critical phase, where he starts writing books like The Critique of Pure Reason. And I feel like I experienced something very similar with Hume. Again, coming from, am I a Humean about like the mind? No. Do I think that Hume is someone that you're going to have to wrestle with? Yes. So my third favorite philosophy book is The Confessions by St. Augustine. St. Augustine, if you don't know this, is like a towering figure in Western philosophy and Western theology. And The Confessions is probably not his greatest work. Probably his greatest work is a book called City of God. The Confessions at first reads like a memoir. It is Augustine explaining his conversion, but the Confessions is actually so much more than that. Within the pages of the Confessions, while you're learning about St. Augustine's story, you're also hearing his reflections on language. Probably the most profound stuff is on Augustine's nature of time and the relationship between time and knowledge of the self. Augustine is sort of painfully aware of the fact that we actually know ourselves through memory, because even as we reflect on ourselves, we're reflecting on ourselves in the past, a thing that no longer exists. Augustine is again one of those great examples of classical philosophers for whom fairly esoteric seeming discussions like the nature of time or Augustine's sort of idiosyncratic interpretation of the first couple chapters of the book of Genesis ends up actually becoming relevant to how Augustine views himself as a living being just trying to make it in the world. My second favorite philosophy book, though, is After Virtue by Alistair MacIntyre. After Virtue, in a way, is kind of like the framing device for a lot of this list. Because if you want to look for like the fundamental claim of After Virtue, it's that we have to make a choice. And that choice is either Nietzsche or Aristotle. And spoilers, my number one pick is a book by Aristotle. He will then also go on when to say, even if we become Aristotelians again, and so we embrace a sort of virtue theoretic version of ethics, we have to understand how any of that stuff is mediated to us through tradition. You know, one of the examples that he gives that I think is really interesting is the way that Thomas Aquinas takes Aristotle's ethics, but because he's a Christian theologian, he inserts charity or kind of Christian love into the list of virtues. And this isn't just an addendum where you get to just kind of tack on a virtue to Aristotle's big list. It's actually that uh, caritas, the Latin here, transforms all the other virtues. Why is that an interesting example? Well, it's an example of a thinker inheriting an idea through history, but then mediating it through, you know, these other factors. And then it trans so it's both inherited and transformed and then passed on. And this is what it means to actually be sort of informed by history or tradition, instead of it being merely regurgitating all the things that have come before and all of the things that people have said before, it ends up being a creative act and a sort of ongoing conversation with the past and anticipating that conversation with the future. One of the main reasons though that this book is so high on my list is that this is the book that saved my love of philosophy. So when I had left graduate school, I got into the tech world and you know I was bitter because I felt like I hadn't made it in academia and you know, I think nowadays the majority of humanities PhDs cannot get academic jobs. So this wasn't a unique problem to me. And I sort of wondered like, what was the point? Did I just waste a decade of my life? And I took a long time off reading philosophy. And then I read After Virtue and I was like, oh, 
I love philosophy again. And this is what inspired me to read more of the Greeks. This is what inspired me and tell me I one day would really need to read Nietzsche. This was someone putting Hume and Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard into conversation. This, this book was one of those invigorating reads that sort of changed how I was going to do philosophy going forward. Or in this case, actually, one made me want to do philosophy at all going forward. I think that if you have Alistair McIntyre as your number two pick in philosophy, your your first pick should be Aristotle, and that's true for me. And that's that book is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is the central text for virtue ethics, which I think is really the only viable ethical theory out there. <laughs> And that's my bold claim here. I think utilitarianism is bankrupt. I think Kantianism doesn't work in the end. I think basically the only kind of ethics that really makes sense is virtue ethics. And I am not a strict Aristotelian, right? Anyone who listens to this channel know that I like the Stoics. The Stoics disagree with Aristotle about virtues, but also there have been many different interpretations of virtue that you see throughout history. You see this, um, for instance, in the Christian tradition. You see this both in Catholic and Orthodox interpretations, but you also see non-Aristotelian versions of virtue, for instance, in the Chinese tradition. And I think you need to kind of assimilate all of these if you're gonna give a comprehensive theory of virtue. Speaking biographically again, this was another one of those seminar books that I read where we only read one book for an entire seminar, and maybe that's just the key to really loving a book, is just spending time with people who are engaged and interested and just talking about it in depth for roughly three months. That might be the way to really fall in love with a book. And what's interesting about it is that I think on all of the details of virtue, or almost every detail of virtue, I often disagree with Aristotle. Because Aristotle, is, when he wants to uh, sort of figure out his theory, he will often appeal to the sort of conventional wisdom of ancient Greece. And we live in a very different time than ancient Greece now. And that means we also have very different conventional wisdoms. So what he took to be kind of intuitive and obvious about moral life, I view as sometimes abhorrent or ridiculous. And so you actually have to figure out the details of the theory sort of independently of reading Aristotle. But Aristotle is giving you a sort of framework to think about virtue that is, in my mind, indispensable. But you can't talk about the Nick McKeon ethics without talking about the prolonged discussion of friendship. Friendship is one of those topics that I think we all take for granted and act as if it's sort of obvious. Of course, friends are good. I like to have friends. Friends are just people that I like. Aristotle gives you a full-blown theory of friendship in the Nicomachean Ethics. One of the surprising conclusions that you're going to reach, but I think is just true, and anyone who doesn't believe this just doesn't understand the matter, is that you probably don't have very many friends. At most, you're going to only have a handful, and that's because friendship is difficult. Friendship takes a lot of work. And friendship is something that really can only be shared between a few people who are like-minded and kind of almost in Aristotelian language, almost share a soul. And it was those kind of things about friendship, again, where classical philosophy was showing me that me being a philosopher and me living my life were actually one and the same activity.